Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Lunch and Learn with a doctor on gastroesophageal reflux disease. My name is Kathy Chern and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by St. Peter's University Hospital and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Today's speaker is Dr. Sugirdana Vilpari, gastroenterologist and director of the Gastrointestinal Motility and GERD Therapy Lab at St. Peter's University Hospital and Assistant Program Director of St. Peter's Gastroenterology and Hepatology Fellowship Program. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. The doctor will answer questions at the end of the talk. The doctor will not be able to offer personal medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I shall turn things over to Dr. Vilpari. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Catherine, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm very happy that all of you are able to join me today. I know some of you are actually my uh, own patients at East Brunswick, and so hopefully you find this lecture beneficial. Uh, so let's get started here. Uh, so as Catherine said, the talk today is on uh, <clears throat> GERD, which is short for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. All right, so what are we going to cover today? Um, first, we're going to cover what is reflux disease, what entails that uh, entity, that disease entity, the risk factors for it, uh, how do we diagnose acid reflux, the complications of it, and finally, the treatment modalities uh, for reflux disease. So, People interchange the names for GERD. Um, some, some patients or uh, providers will say reflux disease, others will say acid reflux, heartburn, pyrosis, regurgitation. Um, so the two typical symptoms for reflux disease is heartburn and regurgitation. And heartburn essentially is a painful burning sensation in the middle of the chest. Uh, it can start uh, in the upper part of your stomach and radiate all the way up to your throat. It typically strikes after meals and it can last several hours or even throughout the whole day. Uh, this discomfort can worsen uh, when someone is bending over, lying down, exercising, or exerting themselves. The second common typical symptom of reflux disease is regurgitation. And this is where there's a perception of flow of reflux stomach contents up into the mouth. And sometimes uh, it can actually even be di undigested food. But typically uh, patients will complain of uh, the sour taste in their mouth uh, and they can sometimes even feel that uh, radiating up from their stomach up into their throat. And so these are the two typical symptoms of reflux disease. However, there is quite a few atypical symptoms uh, of reflux disease as well. And this includes a chronic cough. The two other common reasons for a chronic cough include post-nasal drip and asthma. And so sometimes it's multifactorial where it's all three causes. And so uh, quite often uh, we work with the pulmonologists as well as our ear, nose and throat doctors and colleagues uh, to uh, really get to the bottom of why someone has a chronic cough. And sometimes with reflux disease, that's the only symptom that you have. You might not have the typical symptoms of heartburn and regurgitation uh, that I spoke about. Other symptoms uh, that are atypical, uh, asthma. Uh, so asthma can be exacerbated by reflux and vice versa. Asthma um, can exacerbate reflux, but reflux can exacerbate asthma. And, and so quite often uh, those two are um, a combined entity. You can get a change in your voice or hoarseness, uh, chronic throat clearing. Uh, some patients uh, complain of uh, chest pain, usually after eating. Uh, although uh, when uh, someone complains of chest pain, our first goal is to make sure it's uh, not the heart causing that. And if uh, it's, it's not a heart issue, uh, then it's a non-cardiac chest pain. And one of the uh, entities that can cause it is acid reflux. 
Um, there can be trouble swallowing, especially if there's complications of reflux, which we'll get into. Uh, water brash, which is uh, this feeling of excess saliva accumulation in the back of the throat or inside your mouth. A uh, globus sensation, which is uh, where you always feel like something's kind of stuck in your throat, but there's really nothing stuck there. Uh, it's most likely due to uh, irritation of that throat area because of reflux, uh, giving you that sensation that uh, there's something there. Um, some patients, they go see their dentist and they have uh, multiple dental erosions. And uh, sometimes the dentist will ask them if they have acid reflux. Uh, and this can happen because uh, of the damage from, from the acid itself and halitosis, which is bad breath. So why does um, uh, GERD happen? Uh, well, as you can see here, um, once you swallow uh, food or drink, uh, drink any liquids, uh, it makes its way down your esophagus and into the stomach. Uh, with gravity's help, uh, there's a muscular valve called the lower esophageal sphincter, uh, which you have uh, labeled right here. Uh, and that sphincter keeps stomach acid in the stomach uh, from refluxing back into your esophagus. And in patients who have reflux quite often, uh, this sphincter does not work well, whether it's because it's not strong enough or perhaps because of some sort of anatomic defect, uh, the diaphragm muscle, which helps uh, strengthen that sphincter is not working properly. So quite often uh, there's a, a abnormality with the sphincter, uh, either it's displaced or it's weak. And quite often that's the uh, reason behind, uh, or one of the reasons why uh, you can develop acid reflux. Uh, this is just another description um, of uh, uh, how uh, our body functions when we eat. Uh, so essentially, uh, once you eat your food, there is acid that is uh, created and that acid mixes with, uh, with your food. And so if that sphincter, which is right here between your esophagus and stomach, uh, there's an abnormality with that sphincter, then it's easy for stomach contents to reflux back up into the esophagus, causing the symptoms of acid reflux. So who is at risk for reflux disease? What are the risk factors? Well, anyone can really develop acid reflux, uh, but there are certain lifestyle factors affect how well the sphincter works, as well as the amount of acid being produced by the stomach. One of the, uh, if not the biggest risk factor for acid reflux is being overweight or obese, uh, the presence of a hiatal hernia, uh, which I'll describe a little bit more into detail. Uh, eating large meals or certain types of foods or drinks. Uh, so we typically um, uh, see that uh, acidic foods, citrus types foods, spicy foods, uh, fatty or greasy foods, uh, chocolate, mint, uh, ca caffeinated beverages, including uh, coffee, uh, alcohol, uh, smoking, uh, these are uh, typical uh, foods and drinks that we see uh, that trigger uh, reflux symptoms. Wearing tight-fitted clothes, uh, that's more of a pressure issue. So uh, if you have uh, something pressing on your stomach and it's quite tight, uh, then it's going to also cause reflux into your esophagus. Certain medications, and actually quite a few medications, uh, can trigger acid reflux, uh, including antidepressants. Um, if you're on uh, painkillers such as uh, uh, Vicodin or uh, morphine or Dilaudid, um, composing some uh, anti-nausea medicines, some asthma medications, even some blood pressure medications. Uh, so there's quite a few medications that can trigger acid reflux. Uh, and the thought is that can, uh, those medicines work on that sphincter that I was speaking about and, and can loosen or uh, decrease the strength of that sphincter. Uh, but quite often, many of these medications are treating other um, uh, medical problems uh, are, are, are necessary. And so we can't really stop those, although we try to uh, keep patients on the lowest effective doses. If 
there is a history of scleroderma, of systemic sclerosis. This can affect the esophagus uh, where uh, the muscles of the esophagus don't work well and that sphincter uh, becomes really weak. And these patients are at very high risk for reflux and quite often uh, they're on very high doses of medicines to treat it. Um, and finally, uh, excessive uh, alcohol use as well as tobacco use, these can be other risk factors for, uh, for acid reflux. So what is a hiatal hernia? Um, well, first of all, a hernia in general is, it's any time there's an internal body part that pushes into an area where it doesn't belong, and that's what's called a hernia. Uh, in this case, it's uh, a hiatal hernia is where there's an opening in the diaphragm. So this is your diaphragm muscle right here. And that muscle um, separates your, uh, your chest from your abdomen. And so typically your stomach is below that diaphragm muscle. Uh, what happens with the hiatal hernia is part of that stomach finds a way up into your chest cavity. And so when that happens, uh, that sphincter that I was speaking about, which is usually right at that diaphragm muscle, is now displaced upwards towards the chest cavity. And so both now uh, that sphincter doesn't work very well because it's not getting that added strength from the diaphragm muscle, but now part of your stomach is somewhere where it shouldn't be. And so there's different types of hiatal hernias. One is a sliding hernia, one's a peristophageal hernia. Uh, the bottom line is uh, having one of these can predispose you to acid reflux. So again, what is the role of hiatal hernia and reflux? So again, as I was saying, um, it can weaken that sphincter um, and Quite often you can have a hernia without any reflex symptoms, uh, but if someone does have reflex symptoms, um, uh, many of them do have this hernia and we do assess for this uh, when performing an endoscopy or uh, some sort of swallow study with a radiologist. So obesity, uh, as I was mentioning before, is one of the risk factors for uh, acid reflux. And uh, this is essentially where there's excess body fat accumulation, uh, which has uh, bad effects on your health, including uh, uh, the development of acid reflux. Uh, and the numbers are quite alarming. Um, the percentage of patients in America uh, who are adults that are overweight uh, is 70%. And out of that uh, 70%, um, well, 38% of them are obese. Um, and so uh, this is a, uh, an issue, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue that uh, not only affects us from a reflex standpoint, but obesity, being overweight, uh, has a lot of other ramifications and uh, is a risk factor for uh, many other medical problems, uh, one of them being acid reflux. Uh, so just to go over a, uh, the classification of how we label um, uh, a person as being overweight or obese. Uh, so normal weight, and this is a combination of both your height and weight taken together, and this is how this number is calculated. Uh, a normal weight is usually uh, with a, a body mass index between 18.5 to 25. And again, uh, we take your height and weight and come up with this number. Uh, and there's calculators online uh, that can give you this number if you plug in your height and weight. Um, overweight is once your body mass index is greater than 25, and then you're classified as obese once your body mass index is greater than 30. And within obesity, there's three different classes. And obviously the higher uh, your uh, class of obesity, the higher your risk for complications, including acid reflux. Uh, but that being said, I've seen many people who are normal weight or even underweight that have acid reflux. So how do we diagnose uh, acid reflux? <clears throat> so uh, in most patients uh, who come to my clinic or a gastroenterology clinic, uh, we, uh, we go through a thorough history and really try to um, figure out what their uh, real symptoms are that, that are bothering them. 
And quite often, uh, just from the symptoms themselves, uh, we can come up with a suspicion for acid reflux and, uh, and, and treat them appropriately. Um, however, the gold standard um, is an uh, endoscopy with reflux testing. And I'll go through the two types of acid reflux testing that can give us really objective evidence that you have acid reflux. Um, although uh, there's typical symptoms of acid reflux, um, these symptoms are not um, uh, always due to acid reflux. And so if someone does not uh, respond to the regular treatment uh, for acid reflux, then quite often we need to really try to get objective evidence to figure out is this actually truly acid reflux or is there some other reason such as a motility disorder uh, or something maybe in the stomach that's going on that's causing the symptoms. Um, and so quite often we will need to proceed into actually really doing objective testing with an endoscopy and pH testing. And I'll go over the two types that we typically use. Uh, there's also the esophageal manometry, and that's a test to really look at how the muscles of your esophagus work, uh, because quite often if the muscles of your esophagus don't work well and it's not pushing food and liquid down into your stomach, then that can also cause symptoms that are uh, like acid reflux, but really it's because the esophagus isn't working too well. So the two types of uh, reflux testing. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, uh, but uh, the two types is there is a wireless capsule shaped device uh, test, which is called the Bravo, uh, uh, Bravo test for acid reflux. And uh, what happens here is during your endoscopy, um, we attach this capsule that you see right here to your esophagus. And this stays there. Um, and uh, you, you basically have a monitor on you for about two days. Um, and you can see that right here uh, with the receiver. And um, this will uh, document how much acid is being refluxed up into your esophagus over a two day period. And then this uh, receiver is brought back to us and then we review the results uh, and determine if you really have true acid reflux the certain parameters uh, that uh, we use to diagnose it. Uh, the second method is a trans, uh, trans uh, nasal place catheter. And obviously, as you can see, this is uh, not the most comfortable test. Um, and so quite often we use the wireless because you can't see it, it's inside your esophagus, and this falls off after a few days. But the second uh, method is a trans, a trans nasal place catheter, uh, where essentially you go home with this catheter down your nose for about 24 hours, um, and this will assess how much reflux is occurring. It gives, it gives us some additional information that the Bravo capsule might not. So sometimes we do resort to using this as well, uh, but quite often we'll start with the Bravo capsule and if needed, uh, we will also perform the second test as well. Uh, so this is just to show you the two types of common uh, ways that we assess for uh, acid reflux. So how common is this problem? Uh, well, in the Western world, uh, the prevalence is about 20%. Um, and so uh, out of every five people uh, out there, uh, at least one person uh, is affected by, uh, by acid reflux. And why is it important? Um, well, it's important to know uh, if you uh, have acid reflux because this can cause other complications and we'll go through those complications. So the complications of reflux disease, um, esophagitis, esophageal ulcers, strictures, Barrett's esophagus, uh, esophageal cancer, again, not very common, but it is a risk factor. Uh, reflux is a risk factor for esophageal cancer, lung and throat problems. And we'll get through, uh, we'll go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. Finally, um, Many patients have such severe symptoms that their day-to-day -day quality of life is decreased as well. And I think this is a complication in itself. Uh, these are medical complications, but this is really a complication where um, uh, quite often uh, the reflux is so bad that uh, patients' day-to-day -day life is just, uh, their quality of life is terrible. So the first complication, esophagitis, esophageal ulcers. 
Um, this is essentially where um, acid reflux is causing uh, inflammation and true damage to your esophagus. And this can happen up to 40% of patients who have rural acid reflux. And you can see here, um, <clears throat> this is normal mucosa, okay? Um, but you see these little irritation spots, and this is esophagitis, this is esophageal ulcer, and this is injury that's caused by the excess exposure of your esophagus uh, to, uh, to acid. And sometimes this is so severe uh, that it can cause bleeding, but it can also cause strictures. And so uh, when your esophagus starts to narrow, uh, quite often people will start to complain of trouble uh, swallowing, food getting stuck in their chest. Uh, and this could be because that inflammation became so severe that's it's causing fibrosis and scarring and now a narrowing, uh, which will affect, uh, will affect uh, a person's ability to eat. Barrett's esophagus. Um, some of you have, might have heard of this entity. And this is where the normal cells of your esophagus, uh, it typically happens in the lower part of your esophagus, are replaced by a different type of cell. And this is usually caused by reflux disease. And the reason why it's important for uh, gastroenterologists, as well as a patient to know if they have this, is uh, this is a precursor to esophageal cancer. And there's certain risk factors for developing Barrett's esophagus. So what are the risk factors for developing Barrett's esophagus? Um, it's essentially in patients who are, uh, who've had chronic long-term reflux for many, many, many years on a frequent basis, more than uh, on a weekly basis and are much older, uh, usually, uh, age 50 or older. Uh, that being said, I've seen it in people even younger who've had reflux since they were in their 20s. Uh, the male sex, uh, white or Caucasian race, elevated body mass index, so if you're overweight or obese, uh, history of smoking or current smoking, um, and a previous uh, family history of Barrett's or esophageal cancer, especially in a first degree relative. All of these are risk factors for developing Barrett's esophagus. And so uh, when a patient comes and sees us in clinic, uh, we certainly uh, keep this in mind and, um, uh, and, and figure out if there are these risk factors uh, and determine if a patient is a candidate for screening for Barrett's. Uh, again, not everyone with acid reflux uh, requires screening, uh, but if you have a few of these risk factors, then we certainly um, have a very low, low threshold uh, to assess for Barrett's esophagus. So how do we assess for esophagitis, ulcers, strictures, narrowing, Barrett's esophagus? It's with an upper endoscopy. And this is where uh, under sedation, uh, a camera is placed through the mouth through, uh, through the esophagus all the way into the stomach. And so uh, we'll uh, take a look at the whole esophagus, uh, look for any abnormalities from acid reflux. At the same time, we can also uh, assess the stomach, make sure there's no uh, ulcers or inflammation there, and even part of the small intestine. And so uh, it is great in terms of um, uh, essentially looking at the organs of uh, the upper abdomen uh, when it comes to acid reflux. Now to diagnose Barrett's, um, quite often, uh, it's not just looking at the esophagus, but taking samples, uh, which do not hurt. Uh, it's also under sedation, and those samples are sent to a pathologist, and that's how we make the definitive diagnosis of Barrett's. So what are the symptoms of Barrett's? Well, there is no symptoms of Barrett's, and so that's why it's important for us to really decide if there's risk factors for Barrett's, uh, which would then uh, prompt an upper endoscopy. Uh, the symptoms of Barrett's is similar to reflux, but reflux causes Barrett's. And as I said before, uh, all Barrett's is a changing uh, the lining of the esophagus. So it doesn't have any symptoms that are different than regular acid reflux. Um, 
And for some patients, which is uh, can be scary, uh, is you might not have any symptoms at all because over time your esophagus has become desensitized and uh, you might've had severe reflux symptoms years ago, uh, but now over time you, you haven't really uh, had much uh, uh, reflux symptoms uh, because your esophagus has, de, uh, has desensitized. Um, so, uh, you know, it can be a tough uh, diagnosis to make. Um, and so we always uh, try to have a very low threshold uh, to, to evaluate uh, this if, uh, if we deem necessary. So how is Barrett's esophagus treated? Uh, essentially, it's with antacids, and it's a, a certain type of antacid. It's our proton pump inhibitors. Uh, and those are your meprazole, uh, which is Prilosec. There's uh, as a meprazole, which is Nexium, um, uh, Pentoprazole, which is Protonix, Dexlansoprol, which is Dexalant. I know they have two names for all of these drugs. And so uh, those proton pump inhibitors are the uh, treatment to, to prevent the progression of Barrett's uh, to esophageal cancer, which is what we're trying to prevent. Uh, now, if uh, we do monitor patients who have Barrett's esophagus every few years, and we see uh, that it's advancing to uh, the next level, uh, then there's certain ablative therapies where we can try to burn the Barrett's and get rid of it. Um, but uh, just regular Barrett's, uh, there's no need for that. It's only if it starts to uh, worsen in terms of the type of Barrett's it is. Um, now, what is the true comp, uh, risk of getting esophageal cancer if you have Barrett's? Uh, well, there is a 30 to 50 fold increased risk, but you know, the, the, the chances of getting esophageal cancer is still quite low. It's about 0.5% of patients with Barrett's esophagus uh, develop esophageal cancer per, per year. And so um, as long as we're treating it appropriately with the acid reflux uh, medicines, and as long as we're keeping an eye on it every few years, uh, then uh, we are able to prevent um, uh, the development of acid, uh, or I'm sorry, esophageal cancer uh, in, in the majority of our patients. And this is just to really demonstrate how uh, esophageal cancer is uh, on the rise. Um, there are two types of esophageal cancers. There is um, esophageal adenocarcinoma, which affects the lower part of the esophagus, and that's what's associated with acid reflux. There's a second type called squamous cell carcinoma, and that typically uh, affects the upper portion of your esophagus, and that's more due to tobacco use, although tobacco use can also trigger acid reflux. And for one reason or the other, just looking at these two charts here, um, the blue line is for squamous cell carcinoma, and the green line is for adenocarcinoma, which is the one that's associated with acid reflux. And as you can see throughout the decades, uh, that um, uh, incidence of, of uh, adenocarcinoma has, has gone up. Um, <clears throat> mainly in males. In females, uh, it's, uh, the, the risk of squamous cell and adenocarcinoma has uh, leveled out, uh, but essentially in males, uh, it has gone up. And it's unclear exactly why. Uh, perhaps more patients are getting acid reflux uh, from being obese and overweight and all those risk factors we we're talking about. Uh, and so we think that's probably why um, you know, there is that increased incidence of esophageal cancer that's attributed to the acid reflux. And so that's even more important of why you know, it's important to, to be evaluated uh, if you have frequent symptoms of acid reflux uh, to be tested and, and ruled out for Barrett's. Again, this is just another chart to demonstrate how, um, although the, the, the rates of esophageal cancer are still low, uh, the incidence uh, where uh, the, the number of patients um, getting esophageal cancer uh, is increasing uh, compared to the other cancers. Uh, but again, uh, still the rates of esophageal cancer are much lower, it's just the incidence of it seems to be rising. So lung and throat problems, that's one of the other complications from acid reflux. Um, <clears throat> not everyone, um, acid reflux gets uh, throat issues, uh, but patients where it does reach the throat, it can cause inflammation of the vocal cords. And this is where you can get a sore throat, a change in your voice, chronic throat clearing. 
It can also be inhaled into your lungs. The reflux can cause um, uh, occasionally aspiration pneumonia. Um, it can worsen asthma symptoms and uh, sometimes, uh, very rare, uh, it can also cause fibrosis and chronic damage of, of, of the lungs. Uh, I've seen a few of these, but still very, very rare. And it's typically people who've had uncontrolled reflux for many, many, many years uh, who developed this. Okay, so reflux symptoms uh, or reflux therapy. Um, <clears throat> The initial therapy for all patients with acid reflux is really lifestyle and dietary modifications. Um, through our data and our literature, uh, the three most helpful treatments lifestyle-wise to reduce acid reflux uh, symptoms is weight loss. Placing the uh, head of a bed um, about four to six inches, elevating the head of your bed about four to six inches. Sometimes I recommend patients to uh, buy a, uh, a wedge pillow from Amazon um, or any store uh, or using a few pillows, but it seems like a wedge pillow is a little bit more comfortable. And third, avoiding late night meals. So I recommend patients to, um, if they're sleeping at 10, not to really eat anything after seven. So waiting at least three hours. Um, all that food is still in your stomach. And so if you go right to bed, uh, it's going to have a very easy time refluxing back into your esophagus. Uh, and especially fatty meals tend to uh, be the higher trigger, but uh, either way, avoiding late night meals. So those are the three uh, most helpful lifestyle changes. Now, selective elimination of dietary triggers. Uh, this is a tricky one. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, citrus, acidic foods, spicy foods, <clears throat> Uh, uh, fatty, greasy foods, uh, alcohol, caffeine, um, chocolates, mint. These all are common triggers, but it's not the same for everybody. So it's individualized patient to patient. And so quite often what I uh, typically do in the beginning is start a bland diet by removing all of these but then also having the patient really have a food diary, keep a food diary and see if there's certain foods or drinks that trigger their symptoms. I've seen patients who uh, they take one bite of spaghetti with tomato sauce and they have the worst reflux. And then I have another patient who can have spaghetti three times a day and have no symptoms of reflux, but then a piece of chocolate causes them terrible acid reflux. And so although these are all common triggers, quite often uh, there are certain triggers for each patient and um, it's important to individualize that so we're not really limiting their diet too much uh, as a general statement. Wearing loose fitted clothes and then avoiding uh, tobacco and excessive alcohol. So those are the main lifestyle and dietary modifications. If those don't help, then quite often we need to start a medicine. Um, the over-the-counter Tums and calcium carbonate, um, which uh, Maalox, and those are okay if you have occasional reflux, maybe once or twice a month. Um, but if you're having more frequently, we'll try uh, the weaker antacids such as Pepsid, Zantac is off the market now. Um, so there's Pepsin and Cimetidine. Uh, but if you're having symptoms on a weekly basis, uh, then most likely you're going to need uh, the stronger uh, acid antacid medicines, which are your proton pump inhibitors. A couple of examples are Meprazole or Pantoprazole. Some of, the, some of these you can get over the counter, uh, others you need a prescription. And so um, for the majority of our patients, uh, lifestyle dietary modifications, plus or minus antacid medicines will do the trick. However, um, there are a subset of patients where uh, unfortunately, um, once they are diagnosed with acid reflux, again, we have to make sure there's no other causes that are causing their symptoms that are refractory to these, uh, uh, these, uh, these treatments. Uh, they might need uh, additional interventions. And these are more invasive interventions, uh, including surgical and endoscopic interventions. Uh, and just to touch upon uh, some of the options out there, uh, one is a fundoplication. What is that? If you have a hiatal hernia, um, then sometimes that needs to be fixed, right? So you got to bring the stomach down to where it's supposed to be. And then you take part of the stomach and wrap it around the esophagus uh, to hopefully prevent a recurrence of the hernia plus prevent reflux of 
uh, stomach contents up into your esophagus. And so if you have a very large uh, hiatal hernia, uh, sometimes this is the recommendation. There's also a um, relatively newer uh, procedure called the Lynx procedure. And this is where um, if you don't have a very large hernia, uh, you can bring that stomach down and then place uh, this uh, magnet around that sphincter uh, between the esophagus and stomach. And that sphincter helps prevent acid reflux. And um, I've had a few of my patients uh, get this and uh, they've done quite well. Uh, there's also a couple endoscopic therapies that we can uh, provide. One is a strata uh, therapy, which is basically ablation of that sphincter causing um, uh, uh, a narrowing. Uh, it's almost like a functional narrowing of your esophagus uh, so that uh, that sphincter is a little bit tighter and works a little bit better. Um, and uh, the transoral incisionless fundoplication. Um, this is a newer entity, and this is where instead of going through uh, the surgical route for uh, hiatal hernia uh, repair, you can go through an endoscopic route where we actually use uh, the endoscopy uh, to, to create the fund application. Um, and so uh, obviously there's a lot more information about these different uh, options, um, depending on where you go, uh, depending on where you live, um, you know, these options, uh, some of them are available and others might not be. So uh, it also depends on that. But um, the bottom line is uh, uh, patients who are uh, objectively diagnosed with acid reflux, who are refractory to lifestyle and uh, medical therapy, uh, there are surgical and endoscopic therapies to help out. So in summary, um, just to wrap up here, uh, again, heartburn, regurgitation, those are your typical symptoms of reflux, uh, but there's quite a few atypical symptoms uh, that can cause, um, um, that, that can be due to acid reflux. Uh, there is uh, objective methods to diagnose acid reflux other than just uh, going off of a patient's symptoms. Uh, we always start with lifestyle modification um, and if needed, uh, medical therapy, including antacid therapy for acid reflux. However, uh, if those are suboptimal or refractory, uh, then there's, a, there's certainly medical, uh, I'm sorry, there's surgical or endoscopic um, options available. Again, treatment isn't just to improve uh, symptoms, but it's also to prevent the complications that we spoke about. And one of the complications is Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor to esophageal cancer. And certainly it's important for us to evaluate that in certain patients so that we can monitor it and treat it appropriately. So that is, uh, that is the end of my talk today. Um, this is just some humor. Um, that, uh, that you can see on my slide, so. All right. Okay, thank you. So um, we'll start the uh, Q&A session now. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. And as a reminder, the doctor is unable to offer personal medical advice to attendees during this program. So, um, so we have a previously submitted question. Uh, will drinking aloe juice and apple cider juice help prevent acid reflux? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have a few patients that have come in and uh, have also mentioned uh, that these, um, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, taking these products uh, have helped their symptoms. You know, from my medical literature, uh, there is no great uh, evidence to suggest that these are um, uh, helpful in treating acid reflux. Uh, part of it isn't so much that it doesn't help, we just don't have many studies that are done on that. So um, that being said, uh, if you have occasional symptoms, uh, and it works, then great. However, really someone who has frequent acid reflux symptoms, we don't uh, recommend that as a mode of therapy uh, and uh, whether it's really effective or even safe to be taken uh, frequently or every day uh, is unknown. So uh, we certainly go with, um, um, uh, with uh, evidence-based literature uh, and at this time, uh, there isn't much uh, to really recommend that um, from a medical perspective. 
And then what are foods that will help prevent acid reflux? Um, so uh, there isn't any food that necessarily prevents acid reflux. It's more so um, avoiding foods that trigger acid reflux. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly went uh, over, you know, those common food triggers. Uh, that being said, I've had people who come in and they say uh, a certain vegetable triggers their symptoms. And so um, uh, sometimes uh, it might be an uncommon food trigger, uh, which, um, occasionally is a healthy food, such as onions or broccoli. So, um, you know, overall, there isn't any foods that prevents acid reflux. It's more so avoiding food triggers um, uh, is, is, uh, is where we are. Um, again, uh, if uh, we, we do tend to see greasier foods and spicier foods to trigger symptoms, and so, uh, and they tend to be more of the unhealthy types of foods. So, uh, we've noticed some more uh, high fiber diets, eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, uh, limiting the amount of uh, grease in your food uh, does help um, uh, limit uh, reflux symptoms. We have a little comment that they like the comic. <laughs> and then <laughs> another question, is PPI treatment dangerous long-term? Yeah, great question. Um, so, <laughs> With proton pump inhibitors, uh, just like any medicine out there, uh, they, they can certainly have side effects. And there is more and more literature coming out stating that these medicines can be associated with quite a few adverse uh, effects out there. However, none of them have actually been proven uh, to be the cause of those adverse effects, uh, just more of an association. Could that be because so many people are on these medicines, a lot of them are older and they're at risk for osteoporosis and renal, dis, uh, renal disease and, uh, and dementia, possibly. Um, overall, these medicines are relatively safe, uh, but what we do in our clinic is to determine, first of all, do you even need the medicine, right? If you don't need the medicine, then obviously the risks outweigh the benefits because you're taking a medicine that potentially could have side effects and that's not doing anything for you. So we try to stop these medicines in people who don't need it. In patients who really need it, we wean them down to the lowest effective dose. Um, and so uh, omeprazole, there's different doses. There's 20, there's 40, there's up to 40 twice a day. And so if your symptoms are controlled on 20 daily, then I'm not gonna keep you on the 40, right? I'm gonna bring you down to the 20 and hopefully that'll decrease uh, your risk for these adverse effects. But if I take you off of this antacid and your symptoms are terrible, then at some point you have to take in your quality of life, the risks of uncontrolled reflux and weigh the risks and benefits and patients who really need these medicines, the benefits do outweigh the risks. Okay, so that's it for questions. All right, so thank you, Dr. Vilpari, for taking the time to present on this topic and to answer our questions. The next topic in this series is basics of inflammatory bowel disease on Friday, November 6th at 12 p.m. noon. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's talk. And thank you, and stay safe. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank right, you thank for you. taking the time out of your day. So uh, hopefully everyone learned a few tidbits about reflux disease. So, wonderful. Thank you. All right, thank you.